Ain't nothing wrong with it. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Let's see. Back it up, back it up, back it up. I, look at what my arm um, doing to the camera. You don't see that? See what? My shirt. Well, my shirt is on with the camera. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Love. Yeah, got you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Today is April the 13th, 2021. As usual, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity of prayer. We thank you, God, for just another opportunity. We thank you, God, for the gift of life. We thank you, God, for the gift of love. God, I ask you that you will be with all the people that are going through at this time. I ask you, God, that you will look over Dante Wright family, that you will be with them, as well as all these other shootings and victims of shootings. I ask you, God, that you will be with them and their families. I ask you, God, that you will be with myself and my family. I ask you, God, that you will look over D. Lee. Nisi and man, and all my, my aunts and uncles, as we celebrate the life of my Aunt Myrna on this week, just strengthen us, oh God, be a comforter, be a keeper, and everything that we need. We ask that you will provide it, oh God. And we thank you in advance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Right. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Marvin Bennett Jr. Show. Um, as usual, put your comments or questions in the in the comments and we about to get this thing started tonight i got a um got a good guest i got a good guest i'm trying i'm trying to multitask and i i thought it was it would be fitting even though we had scheduled this already i thought it was just like divine intervention that this guest will be with me tonight you know going through all that we going through and my family um you know our hearts are real heavy right now so I kind of was glad I had a co-host that kind of keep me in good spirits, keep my head lifted up and funny and insightful. We always have a good conversation. Um, and that's none other than the talented, beautiful, vivacious, as usual, singer, songstress, actress, Janelle Simone. Absolutely. Welcome, welcome back to the show, Janelle. Uh it's, it's good up here. I want to say my condolences, first and foremost. Um, definitely. Right. And we had a conversation earlier before we got on live uh, yesterday. And I mean, I know I don't believe in saying goodbye. I just believe in, I believe that, you know, people move on to other situations yeah. and one be together to go together again with the ancestors and, and everybody who who done passed dear met's gonna be up there rough rider absolutely you know so but definitely my condolences sir i surely appreciate it surely appreciate it um what's been going on in your world now you got a new single out i do well it's coming out on may the 8th my single uh all night is coming out and this is a very interesting song this is one of my favorite songs um it it took a, a year to record and write um well we wrote it but it took us a year to record it but um if you heard 24 karat magic by bruno mars mm -hmm. the beginning of that song is done by a guy named byron uh, I think his name is Byron. I don't know his last name, but his stage name is Mr. Talkbox. And he has opened for Bruno Mars. He has gone on tour with Bruno Mars. But yes, that's his his talk box. That's his voice. And uh, he was so good to me by jumping on this song. So I am one degree of separation from Bruno Mars. The same guy that went on tour with him is the same guy that's going to be on my record. And he's on a good bit of it. Um, so I'm so, so, so excited. And I'm so happy to let you guys hear what I've been working on. It is a good song, and it's right on time for the summertime. Cool. I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to hear it. Are you doing a video for it? I, you know I am. Okay. Somebody told me your song don't exist unless you have a video. So I'm definitely doing a video for it. We shoot the video next weekend. Um, I, I, I'm kind of going outside the box with this. But... Um, I'm excited because I wanted to try something new. I don't want to do the cliche looking at the camera and pointing. I want to dance. I want people, if I'm not dancing to my own music, how can you dance to it? So we're going to definitely uh, do some things, do some things for y'all. All right. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. You you even brought up the D, like, um, like we all suffered a great loss this year, this weekend. Like, you know, it's, it's a lot of hip hop people. I don't care whether you religious, I don't care what it is. 
mm-hmm. you know who Earl Simmons was, you know about DMX, or you know his music, or you seen an interview, or you seen something. But this mm-hmm. dude was like, in my opinion, I, I seen what I felt that it was some kind of disrespectful post, you know, people being like, uh, you know, just y'all need to stop it with all this. He he was this and he was that there. Okay, it's fine for it's fine for you to think that there, but that's just your opinion at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. He he, he might have not ever been in a, in a pulpit, but you know me, I believe that DMX was a vessel for God. He reached masses. He spoke words that some people would never hear. TD Jake's not going to reach them. They're not going to reach. I'm not going to reach them. You know what I mean? Like this dude. I'll never forget one show that I went to, and everybody always talks about how he prayed at his shows, but he is the only hip-hop artist that i ever been to that went to one of his shows, and he actually gave an altar call. He actually gave you an opportunity to come to Christ in the middle of a hip-hop show. You know what I mean? Because he was so not worried about what the industry thought of him or what he was going to walk his own path, the highs and the lows, but he was going to let you walk that journey with him. Like this dude, everything he did was like out of you. You could always feel the passion. You know what I mean? Like he loved hard. You could tell, like if he loved hard and the way he would pray. You know, me and you, we always we had this conversation from time to time about religion. You know, mm-hmm. me, I'm not big on me personally. I'm not the old I get. I am I am religious, but I'm not big on religion. I like mm-hmm. to consider myself more of a spiritual person. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, there are flaws in all religions. So and pull, as opposed to religion, I would rather have a relationship with my creator, with my entity, whatever whatever that belief system is. It's all about that relationship. And like I said, I, I, the, based off the life that he lived, you've seen that he had a relationship. You know what I mean? And I think that's something that people overlook. Like, you know, well, yeah, it might have been drugs. It might have been, we don't know what it is. All we know is that he was gone. But while he was here, he showed you that he had a relationship that was beyond him. It wasn't mm-hmm. about him. It was about that greater power in him and being a vessel, which I feel like at, in, in some capacity, we all need to be doing that. We all need to be impacting our own community with love and showing people, okay, no matter what your belief system is, I'm going to walk this walk and I'm going to talk this talk. I'm going to show you better than I can tell you what the definition of love, love is. I completely agree. Um, so, before we have that conversation, because you gave me some insight, I was one of those people. I definitely was one of those people who basically felt like his death was on him. You know, mm-hmm. um, I thought about the drug use. I thought about the Ian LeVanzant, um, uh intervention. I thought about how he treated his son. I thought about the fact that, you know, he was on, again, he was on drugs. And, and for the people who have never done hardcore drugs in their life, we sit back in observation and we wonder, what made you want to do crack, cocaine, heroin, or w- whatever your drug of choice is where you become addicted to the point where you're willing to throw your life away? So I sat in judgment of DMX. Roxanne Shante, you know, Roxanne, Roxanne, mm-hmm. she a video um, not too long after he had passed away, and she basically stated that he um, he dealt with some demons. And, and, and dealing with demons is so such an ambiguous blanket statement for most people's issues like what kind of demons but she got very specific she basically said that one time that they had a conversation because Roxanne experienced similar issues with being um raped and molested by uh, a guardian and DMX had been placed into the system foster care at a very young age and she didn't go into detail about what happened to him but she alluded to the fact that was some type of predatory behavior that was forced upon him um and through that going to the streets in the system and then finding and then eventually meeting up with somebody who laced this joint with uh crack and then having something to numb the pain of not trying to remember what happened to you Mm -hmm. and when i look at it from that standpoint i can completely see how people because people people can medicate with different things some Mm -hmm. people medicate with avoidance some people medicate with other people with bodies with sex and some people medicate with drugs and and i have to like i told a family member of mine who is who was on drugs is that 
I understand you're doing the best that you can do it with what you have. Because sometimes being um, an addict is all that we see, but we don't see the mother who so happens to be an addict, but they're still a mother or the brother who so happens to be an addict, but they're still a brother. So I definitely, um, having that conversation with you the other day, yesterday, definitely changed my my thought process about uh, DMX. And I do feel sorry. Um, I feel sorry, but I also, you know, on the other end, I'm just, I also think like, yo, some of that responsibility is on his parents, on the person who did whatever they did to him. A lot of it is on his parents. And then some of it falls on him. Cause once you have children, cause he has 17 of them to look at those kids and not pull something within yourself to say, Hey, I got to make a change. Cause that conversation he had with his son was very difficult to watch. And you can see that he had been so far gone with the drug usage and, 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 and really thinking about when he was going to get his next hit that he couldn't even see his son crying out for his presence. Mm. So a lot of it, and then also this leads into a deeper conversation that we can slightly touch on. A lot of it also is the society which we live in that will sit up here and take black boys, put them into systems where they experience perpetual trauma and then push the drugs in those same neighborhoods so they can get addicted to then fall off and be who unfortunately didn't and meet what unfortunately DMX uh, met, which was his untimely death. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's one thing you, you mentioned addiction. Like for me, addiction, addiction is dear, near and dear to my heart because I know addicts. I, I consider myself to be a former addict. I wasn't on nothing heavy, but I consider myself to be an addict. And one thing that I always try to tell people is whether, whether you look at it as being judgmental or not, like if you, if you, if you've never been an addict, if you've never been an addict yourself, you have no right to comment on what an addict should do because you don't know what that's like. You know what I mean? Like science, cl- clinically now is known as addictions are sicknesses. You know what I mean? Whether it's alcoholism, whether it's drugs, whatever, whatever it is, is a sickness. Now, somebody that doesn't have cancer can't tell anybody how they need to be doing. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you, unless you've actually experienced it because some things in this life are stronger than us. You know what I mean? Everybody had, like you said, you mentioned demons. You know, that's one thing, like you said, is, is degrees to it, but we all have our own demons. We all got our crosses a bit. We all got our fights. We all got our struggles. So because I struggle, I struggle with, with, with uh, sex all the time and want to have sex and just being promiscuous, and your 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 demon is you're just a compulsive liar. How how do you look at your sickness as something that's better than mine, or just because you have a better understanding of it? You know, it's so unfair. And and then like, like you said, the responsibility. I'm not saying that he doesn't bear any responsibility. We all have a responsibility to bear in the lives that we live and the choices that we make. Because at the end of the day, that's what life is all about. Life is about choices and the choices that we make. And sometimes, we, you know, there are consequences to those choices that we make and those actions that we take. But when I think about it from a neutral standpoint, like that's a true story. I remember watching this grown man, hardcore, telling his story in tears about how this person that he looked up to, an adult grown man at the age of 13, would lace a cigarette with crack and give it to him, to a 13-year-old child. And even in the video, he's like, yo, man, I thought you loved me. Like, why would you even do, why would you do that to me? Like, why would you do, you're an addict, so you already know what that road is like. Why would you subject another human being to that involuntarily? And at the same time, we're talking about a child. Like, I, my, my, I feel so, some level of extra compassion for him with situations like that there. With young girls, you know what I mean? At the age of five and six years old, these, whatever age it is being molested and raped, not by just strangers, but sometimes family members. Like that, that, that you don't understand what that does to a person psychologically, unless you've actually been through something that traumatic. You know what I mean? It's easy for us to 
sympathize, but it's hard for us to empathize. You know what I mean? Because we don't have, why, why would you, I, don't, I never took a drink a day of my life. So that makes you better than me. <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? You cheat on your, you cheat on your relationship, you cheat on your taxes. You do other things, that's fine. So your your weaknesses, your flaws don't make you better than mine just because they're different or you understand them or those that you will, you will to make those choices. But to me, I just, I just think is, I'm, I'm, I'm not glad that it happened. I'm not, I'm definitely not glad to see him go, but I'm glad that is it, it, is waking up within our society and within our culture, a conversation about, cause you know, at the end of the day, you, it's never, it wasn't to the fact that like he didn't have anybody or he didn't know that people love him. And you know, like I said, being a former addict myself, Listen, the whole wide world, the entire world could want to help you and could want you to change. But you got to want it for yourself. That's that's where it all starts at until you come to that point in place. Like, only thing that you could do is give them positive vibes, prayers, and everything else. But that individual have to make up in their mind that they want to change and they want to do this here and they want to, you know, walk the straight and narrow. So I think, like I said, everybody... Everybody has different personal convictions. So I think sometimes some choices that may be easy for you to make might not be so easy for me to make. Got you. Um, so I believe it's, it's, it's in proximity of where you sit with the person who is dealing with the actual demon. Mm. So, for example, you, you know, so I want to just compartmentalize for just a second so I can make sure I make some very some true statements here. So the first first true statement, which is what I was going based off of my last, you know, kind of rant was that I am, these are all true statements. One, I'm very sorry for what happened to DMX. Two, the bulk of the responsibility should be on a lot of people that help that the sequence of events that had to take place for DMX to be who he was, from his mom leaving him to foster care, to the people who did whatever they did to him when he was a child, to him meeting that brother who did what he did when he was 13, then for him to you know be addicted to drugs and then obviously meet a certain height of fame and success where he had access to that on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, being a father to 10, 13, 15, 16, 17 kids, so, some of the responsibility, which is also true, falls on DMX. Not a lot of it, but yeah. some of it. And I say that because if I was if I was someone, you're right, I never did drugs, I never did hardcore drugs, never been an addict, but also grew up in a family with two parents and they weren't on drugs. And, and my only introduction to drugs was through, was through the television screen. And I'm giving you that based off of that, that objective view based off of a detached experience, then your statement is absolutely correct. I have no, no wherewithal, no seat of judgment, but when you are someone who grows up in a family or when you're someone who has an uncle or auntie or aunt or a mother or a mm -hmm. father, and you sit in the close to proximity of someone who is an addict mm -hmm. and how that affects you and your upbringing and the tra trauma that you, because you also have to take into account if, I understand this addiction. I understand that. I'm not trying to make light of it. But when you make the choice, whether you made it, you know, uh, uh, deliberately or not, but when you make the choice to have kids and then to think, okay, well, I have children, I have an addiction. Now I got to figure out who or what do I prioritize? Mm -hmm. Your kids from the time that they're born to the time that they see you smoke your first piece of crack out of a crack pipe to the time they see you missing and absent to the time where they need you and you're not there that's inducing trauma that is trauma yeah and so they definitely have the right to say what and how and when that affects them mm -hmm. especially as they get older and so children of addicts people who had to grow up in that situation who may not be addicts themselves now have a point of view and an opinion about what it is to be an addict because they had to grow up with it and they yeah. definitely have that right because they sit in such close proximity to that experience now everybody else who doesn't like you said people have been molested you never been molested okay but let's say you your mother was molested and she was raped and you were the product of that rape then you 
directly experienced the trauma and how she responds to you as a child that she had to give birth to out of a traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. So you definitely have a voice and an opinion about seeing other mothers and other little girls who get raped and what that experience will be like for those kids who come out of those situations because you sit in close proximity. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I, I was waiting for you to finish because I absolutely agree with that. When mm -hmm. I was saying that you don't have a say, I mean, I'm speaking specifically to the the being the, the part of being knowing what it's like to being an addict itself. Yeah. Like you said now, on the on the flip side of that coin, like you said, that's real trauma. That's real hurt. That's mm -hmm. real pain that you're suffering. You can't understand why mommy would want to shoot up as opposed to teaching me how to do my hair. You don't understand that. So you you coming from a whole different place, which you can speak of because as the as the addict, you're not thinking or you're not conscious of all the hurt that you would want to. And then even sometimes within that, like I said, I can't speak for no other addict. But there were times in my life during that period where I seen that I was literally hurting and like breaking people down. Mm -hmm. But my addiction was that much stronger than me. And like, like on the inside, you would you would you would you would you'd be crying on the inside because. The people that you care about, you don't want to see them hurt you like that, Dave. But it's not always as easy as making a choice of just like, okay, today is the last day. I'm going to stop. That is that sounds much easier than it is. Because if it was that easy, everybody would do it. I, you would think anybody that has a conscience would do it. But the addiction is much stronger than just making a choice that I'm going to do the right thing for my kids. Because, you know, my kids deserve to have a good father. You know, like we talked about yesterday, you know, you talk about we talked about the um the crack epidemic. Like the crack epidemic destroyed fam black families all across this country. Like literally all across the country. So, you know, we don't get we don't we don't necessarily give passes to the to the moms. You know what I mean? Like you was a crackhead, why would you be out there and your kids ain't got nothing to eat and all that did, but you supplying your habit and all that did. It's like it's easy to, it's, it's, it's so much easy, easier to uh, cast judgment when you don't understand what it's like to be that one. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's totally different. Just like when you're that one, you don't know what it's like to receive the pain. You know what I mean? And all the hurt that you have caused. Because you're, you're it's from two different spectrums. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. Like you definitely can speak from that. And I think that's part of the process, in my personal opinion, of healing. That's why we have to have those conversations about, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad that we're living in a day and age where mental health is being pushed more and being being uh brought more to light and understanding that no, he's just not bad. He doesn't know how to act, he's not hyperactive. There's something up there that's actually wrong. <laughs> You know what I mean? But for years, it was just charged up. And when you think about it, white people didn't go through this when <laughs> when, when, it, when it was them, when little Jimmy was acting out. They took him to the psychiatrist, gave him some letters, ADD or whatever, gave him some Ritalin and all that kind of stuff did. But we would never get tested like that in, our, in, our, in the neighborhoods anyway. Not that I was aware of. I've never been examined mentally, you know what I'm saying, to see what state of mind I was in. I've never did that growing up. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, how do you know, how do you treat a sickness that you doesn't even know exists? True question. I, I um, and so, and then that breaks down mental wellness and therapy and good psychology and psychologists being available to black communities. Now, Here's, here's something that I have uh, issue, and this is opinion based. So I want to make sure that I'm saying the right thing based upon my opinion. If anybody has knowledge, you can put the information in, in, in the chat. But one of the things that I'm learning is that there's, uh, there's this influx of awareness about mental wellness, right? And Black folks, we've been so inundated and conditioned to not want or receive you know psychological help mm -hmm. and a, a lot of it is because we don't trust it because there's been a historical um 
there's been his, historical just evidence of scientists and psychologists using the gift of science and psychology to for the disadvantage mm -hmm. and the disadvantage and the belittlement and dehumanization of black and brown people. So I can understand why we don't trust it. You don't want nobody tinkering up here, right? Mm -hmm. But we're at an age where we have more black therapists than ever, more black psychologists than ever, and psychologists and psychiatrists than ever. So the the access to that help is there. But then we have to have black people also willing to walk through those doors. And a lot of times we have black people going to what the cornerstone of black America is the church. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. And you must rather go talk to your pastor or your deacon or whoever, or maybe a family member than actually going to someone who's certified. Now I'm not saying that every pastor is not certified, but for the most part, they're not certified in the degree of psychology. Exactly. In the medicine of the mind. They're in the medicine of theology, the heart, spirit, spirituality. So that's something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, but we're talking about why you're here and you're dealing with mental dis-ease and you're dealing with mental unwellness. There are people who go to school for this for seven years and write a dissertation to be called a doctor so they can help you out. And there's now I'm learning there's so many programs where they allow you, like if you, if you have a job, we have a 401k. Also check to see if they have what's called EAP benefits. These are benefits where you actually can get anywhere from two to five free sessions per year to go see a licensed therapist or a licensed psychologist. Uh, uh, that's someone who can assist you with going through certain things because the trauma that we have to experience, number one, just by being black. Then you have being black and being male, being black and being woman, being black and being a child. Uh, seeing Dwayne right now, another black man who's been shot and killed like the trauma is const constant and consistent. And we can't keep going through our day-to-day -day lives at these whack-ass nine-to-five jobs, going here for pennies on a dollar, trying to make ends meet, dealing with family, marriages, children, and now trauma on top of trauma, historical trauma, common trauma, com current trauma, and then saying, I'm fine. And then going to church once a week and then unloading your burdens in a pew thinking that, okay, I've done enough. God is going to take care of it. But you're walking out with all that trauma and then you're inflicting it. And so two things are going to happen. Either A, you're not going to be all there to be the man or woman or child you need to be in order to fully express your authentic self and be happy. Or B, you're going to lash out at other people or lash out at yourself. And that can go anywhere from an attitude on the small scale to a large scale being homicidal or suicidal. And that's just the truth. Shout out, what's up, Corey? Shout out, Bev. Bev, you absolutely right. Bev, send me your, your cash app so I can send you an offer. Bev said, Bev said, most pastors need therapy themselves. Like, absolutely. Like, True. Just because just cause you want to pull pit don't make you, like you said, certified to counsel me on pretty much anything, you know, as it is the Bible. <laughs> because, like, a lot of these jokers are just jacked up. They got just as much stuff going on too that they don't want to deal with. So how you if you don't want to deal with your own stuff or go and see somebody to talk to for help, how can you tell me to do the same exact thing? There's a difference between uh, theology and psychology. And Absolutely. that's why the classes are different when you go to college. And so when you think about it that way, you have to separate the church and the mind, the church and the heart. They, they, you know, they can exist and they can overlap in certain situations, right? You know, and when you think about God or when you love God or you love a God or whatever, so you, you're, you're using those two tools, but at the end of the day, they separate sometimes. And when you're going through a whole lot of mess, I understand prayer works, affirmation works, I get all that, but sometimes you need to talk about, talk to somebody that you don't know that can give you the tools and the resources necessary to traverse the trauma that you've experienced. I know that I have a lot of trauma, even currently now. And, and I think depression has become this hot, hot button word that people are using. And I and I and I went to school. Ooh, 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 ooh. I'm back. Okay, I went to school for psychology um, briefly. Um, and one of the things that I learned was there's two types of depression. There's a short term depression that you can never get rid of. It's called cyclothymia. cyclothymia. And I may have mispronounced it, but I know it's cyclothymic or something, but it's very short-term depression. Um, you don't have crazy bouts of emotional outrage, but you can never get rid of it. Then there's one that is 
uh, I'm sorry, that's short, that's long term, but there's one that is short term, but you have those crazy bouts, but you can be medicated for it. Um, so when we use the word depression, everybody's just using like, I'm depressed, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. And it's not really that you're depressed. You may be like spiritually or emotionally recessed or, you know, drug through, but you're not like depressed. It's a real thing. So that's another reason why we have to have adequate resources so we can really determine, is this a psychological chemical issue that you are having that can be medicated? Or is this that you're, this is a situation where your spirit is just broken and you need to be healed? And a lot of that can just be dealt with by going through some form of catharsis. So we need yeah. that. And it goes, to, it goes to what I was saying earlier. What's good at? It goes to what I was saying earlier about, you know, you got to want the help for yourself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like you got to want the help for yourself, even though, all like you said, all those avenues. I know with me personally in my life, one of the hardest things with me was go was go talk to somebody about things that really, really was bothering me the most. But it was so freeing once I actually got it out. You know what I'm saying? Like, it is so therapeutic sometimes just letting out those hurts and, you know, don't 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 even deal with the, don't worry about the embarrassment or, like, if I really tell Janelle this, she, she gonna look at me different. You, you know what I mean? Like, no, you need to get it out because that's part of the healing process that's necessary to take place is in you actually verbalizing what it is that's bothering you. You know, the Bible talks about it, you know, there are power in your words. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we got to learn the power of our words. And, you know, me and you were talking yesterday. You know, we were talking about the difference of words. And I was going to do a show on the power of words. But we were talking about how, you know, the difference between, I was, I was telling you, you know, you can love somebody that you mm -hmm. don't respect. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And respect and trust is two totally different things as well. You know what I mean? But then you got that other word that's called loyalty. Loyalty. Yeah, and I think loyalty is the is the closest example of love of, out of respect and trust. I think loyalty is closer to love because one, they both start with L O, <laughs> but two, you know, it's like when you think about loyalty, like loyalty take like loyalty, it gets past her. You know what I mean? It, loyalty takes you to a whole nother place where like. You really broke me. Like, you really broke me down. You know what I'm saying? You almost destroyed me. You almost took me out emotionally. You know what I'm saying? But I'm still rocking with you. I'm not going nowhere. Like, loyalty is something that's totally different. And we hear, we hear that word. I hear that word growing out, going, going around a lot. But I don't think a lot of people really understand what true loyalty really means. I, I agree. I think... Um... So to touch on another, uh, to touch on that, and also uh, um, what, the very first thing you said about, you know, talking to someone and not being embarrassed about it, um, that is so important for men. That is so necessary, important, that is so advantageous, beneficial, and urgent for, for men, especially men of color, because in this world, we've been socialized that boys and men can express themselves. You have either two emotions, you're either angry or you're horny, but everything in between or outside of those things, you can't be because if so, it, sh it shows a sign of weakness. It shows a sign of that you are less than a man. And when we, and that's that quote, toxic masculinity, where you have everything bottled in and you don't want to talk to someone or won't talk to someone. And I've seen so many men, when they start talking about things, they start crying. And these tears aren't fresh tears. They aren't tears that you just, you know, had in your back pocket the last two two days. Yeah. These two 14 year old boys bottled up. Yeah, it's been bottled the, up. The 13 year old boy who couldn't cry. The 10 year old boy who couldn't cry. So we need especially to have spaces for black men to air out their grievances because the harmful way in which we respond and react to each other as black men and women, um, it starts with that having safe spaces. And when, if we can create, create enough safe spaces, then we can definitely make some changes. Now, you're right. We had a conversation about the difference between loyalty, trust, and love. And I thought that was so prolific when you said it. I was like, oh, you're preaching one today. You're preaching one today. You said a word today. Um, because that is so important because I never thought about 
loving someone that I didn't respect. Because if you ask me, the two go hand in hand. But when you said that, I was like, wait a minute, there are people that I love that I don't respect. Mm -hmm. There are people that I respect, but I don't know enough. Of, I don't know them enough to love them. I love them, yeah. Right. And then there's also people that I'm loyal to that 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 I don't necessarily love, but I'm just the loyalty comes from by way of a business partnership or by way of us having some type of, you know, some type of uh, common ground. Yeah. But this is what we also got into. And I thought this was very interesting, a, a very interesting phenomenon that people with unconditional love, the, the phenomenon of unconditional love and the phenomenon of unconditional loyalty in like, does that exist for you? And we spoke about that briefly. And I told you that I don't have unconditional love and I don't have unconditional loyalty. My love and my loyalty, both LO comes with a price. <laughs> if you're not getting that price, if you're not paying that price, then you don't get that. What about you? Um, I, I agree somewhat. I don't, I, I believe I don't, but I believe the only person that can truly love unconditionally is the almighty creator. Now, I think that we have some levels of what we consider unconditionally, but true unconditional, you know, I end the show every week with the title of my son. I love you intentionally. I love you unconditionally. Because as a father, I would like to think that there's nothing that they could do to ever make me stop loving them. You know what I mean? And that's what, that's my definition of uh unconditional love like if one of my sons was this if i was like marvin Gaye, <laughs> like i would still love my son if you shot me dead i would still love my son it would hurt but i would still love you and it only hurts because i love you you know what i'm saying so it's like but i think i think i think that word is thrown around a lot <laughs> without it's because it sounds good you know what yeah. i mean i love you unconditionally but like you say you say you love somebody unconditionally but the first time you catch an attitude the first time you hear this or you see that, boom, you gone, you out the door. So that's not unconditional love. Like, you know what I mean? You say it is, but no, it was conditional because if it was unconditional, nothing would change. That that part. Uh, you know what? I want to recant my statement. Mm -hmm. So there's the levels to it. Uh, my mother is someone who's who will always get unconditional love from me. Um, because she's my mother. And I know in the, in our community, we've talked to kind of deify, if, if you will, the, the, the black mother, you know, she's the, she's the guy, she's the mother earth. She's, and there's really nothing that you, I mean, most of us were raised by black women. Um, so yes, my mother gets my unconditional love, but there have been times where absolutely like, um, I told people that, you know, you don't get to have access to me if you can't respect me. Mm -hmm. Mother and brother or not child or not you don't get to have access to me and i think if i had kids that will be the first time i would experience unconditional everything unconditional because where i can have unconditional love for my mom because i'm never going to stop loving my mama my mama my mama was not the best mother to young kids but she became a great mother to young adults she's always going to get my love and she's always going to get my unconditional respect that woman gets my respect off top but she does not get unconditional presence. Okay. We got a question real quick. Tashiva okay. asks, can you love someone unconditionally and have conditions on the relationship? No, because that just that 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 defeats the purpose. So can what unconditionally means just that. Exactly. Yeah. So if you say, well, I love you unconditionally, but here's a condition for my relationship, my boundaries, like the, that's still Deal a condition breakers. <laughs> change how, in fact, you love them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not unconditional. Yeah. She said, I still love them. Yeah, and that's the thing. You can not You can still love someone, but it doesn't mean that you love them unconditionally. Right. Like, that's the purpose. That's why the UN is at the front, because it's either conditional or unconditional. And for most yeah, of yeah. us, conditional. Yeah, and no matter how you word it, whether it is deal breakers, or I'm not going to put up with this, or I'm no, not going to tolerate this. Those are all conditions. So yep. by default, that's not unconditional love, in my mm -hmm. opinion. That's not. That is two separate things, yeah. 
Yeah, so you know, right before we end on that part, but but that's that's the thing that I think I think words are powerful, and I think people really need to understand words because, like I told you, you know, people to me, in I, my opinion, I think they get trust and respect totally confused. Okay, and what I mean by that, by that's just my theory or my life philosophy. You know what I mean? Because I respect each individual that I meet. You don't have to earn my respect. You know what I'm saying? I feel like respect should be freely given. Now you can lose my respect, but you're gonna get it from off the off the off the rip because I have no reason not to respect you. I don't know anything about you. Now you have to earn my trust, but you don't you don't have to earn my respect. You see what I'm saying? Trust must be earned. I'm not gonna trust the total stranger, <laughs> you know what I mean, go cash my check for me and bring the cash back. You know what I mean? That has to be established. But I can meet a stranger and respect them respectfully enough. You're not going to go cash my check for them, You know what I mean? But I still respect you as an individual. I just don't know you like that to actually trust you. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, a, it's a big difference to me between uh, trust and respect, and respect. Like respect should be given freely to me. And trust what, what's, what's your thoughts? No, I, I agree. Um, I used to always say there was a concept of losers and earners. So losers was you give it all, if, like you get an A for the day, and you can lose the A depending upon what you do throughout the day. And then earners is you get a zero for the day, and you can increase that zero to an A based upon what you do for the day. So I was always a loser. Like I would give it to you and you could lose it. But when we talk about, like you said, words are powerful. So we talk about different words, then the, the, the concepts are different. Like certain uh, barometers of measurement go out the window because you're right. Based upon the fact that you're a human being and just on basic fundamental levels, I should respect you as a person. I should respect the way you are, who you are, how you show up in the world, your religion, all of that. And I do that. But like you said, I'm not going to, when it comes to trust, that measurement flips over because at that point is I become an earner, okay? You have to earn my trust. Um, so I was married at one time, five months only, but I had been with a guy for four years. And the whole time, like when we, when we broke up, I was so upset and I kind of work, work his story into all my stories because truth, is, truth be told, he taught me a lot, you know? But I, I was, when we broke up, I was so mad and heated and I used to just talk bad about him and be so upset with him because I just, look, I, I'm not so country, him, but uh, <laughs> upset with him because he really, I felt like I hated him. Like, I mean, you lost, and one of the things I had to really come to terms was the phenomenon of duality where two things can exist, two completely opposite things can exist at the same time. And the two truths were, number one, he's a great man. That man changed my life. He's a great man, but he was a horrible husband. It wasn't because he was abusive or anything like that. He was just emotionally unaware, emotionally unavailable, and just not present in the relationship. And with those things, he was a horrible husband. But two things could exist at the same time. So when I figured that out, I realized that, yo, I got mad respect for that brother as a man, as a black brother who's in this world with a big heart. He has one of the biggest hearts I've ever experienced. And probably still to this day, he's a big hearted Negro. But I lost trust in him. The fact that I trusted him to take care of me and to love me the way I needed to be loved. So that duality really plays a lot. And so words are different. I can have the greatest amount of one thing for you and the least amount of the other. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So and before you even went there, one of the comments by Tone was, and said, you know, you could love somebody, but being in love is totally different, which is kind of what you, kind of in the area of what you just explained, you know what I mean? Because it sounds like just talking about, you may still love him, you're not, you're not in love with him no more, but you still have some level of love for him. You know what I mean? Or like you said, you use the word respect. And I gonna I gotta appreciate that there. Especially when you said when you open enough to say, okay, once upon a time I hated this joker, I was in my feelings, but I, I really respect this guy. You know what I mean? That takes a big person because we all don't get there. You know, sometimes we just, you know, when we done, we done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, he always, but yeah, he was gonna get my respect. Um, I didn't respect him afterwards. You know, I thought I had lost that form, but really I had to deal with my own internalized 
uh, expectations because when you go into any relationship, whether it be with a person that you want to be you know intimately, whether it be with a friend or whether it be with uh, you know a one night stand, we all have some semblance of expectations that we want people to meet. And depending upon if you can meet those ex expectations, depends upon if you get our respect, our loyalty, our trust. And so when he didn't meet those expectations, I thought to myself like, yo, you know, f him. <laughs> yeah. And I had to come to terms with sometimes your expectations expectations shouldn't be the only measurement of how you respect love or trust someone sometimes outlying or outlier or outside issues or outside determinants that can factor in how you love someone so now i'm a i'm a, I'm a very grown-ass woman and I have come to terms with the fact that, yo, that man deserved his flowers. He did a lot for my life. He did. He wasn't necessarily everything that I wanted, but baby, he was everything <laughs> that I needed when I needed it. So I'm happy that he existed partially within my life. Um, it was a truncated experience, but I'm grateful that God sent him right on time because God sent him, trust me, because the way I was, God sent him. Mm -hmm, he did. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and like you say, it just goes back to what we were talking about earlier to me, you know, that it, and sometimes it, and that's a funny thing about relationship that I'm going to kind of want to get into on the relationship show that I do is like. Just because I don't display my love for you the way that you will want to receive it doesn't mean that I don't love you. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense to you? You know what I mean? You're, 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 you're wanting something that okay it doesn't mean that i don't feel that same exact way i just have a different way of expressing it or not expressing it but it doesn't mean that i don't love you just because you don't receive my love or vice versa it doesn't mean that you don't love me if i don't receive the love that i necessarily want it you can still love me you know what i'm saying it's just not reciprocated or it's not shown or displayed in the way that i would like to receive it you know what i mean and it was funny because you asked me what we're going to be talking about today. And, and you know, you, you said, what's, what's in the news going on in the news? And I'll be honest. I literally have not watched the news. And I think the last time I watched the bro news broadcast might have really been like uh, February 2020. Like, I have not watched any news. And I never do. And... I watched the news today. I said, I said, well, let me not even the news. I turned to court TV. They got the um George Floyd, the, the officer. Um, I only want to give him respect by mentioning his name, but he's on trial. The first officer, the officer with the knee in the neck that murdered George Floyd. And mm -hmm. it was like I was I was watching it. It was like, this is exactly why I haven't watched the news in forever. Because not only is this trial going on, a trial that I don't even understand why is going on. I don't care about the somatics. He took a life, he should get life. Point blank, period. He took a life, he should get life. I don't want to hear nothing about no 10 to 20, no whatever. First degree, second degree is, a. Hey, the man deserved life. Point blank, period. And it was heartbreaking because while I'm watching this trial, they take a lunch break and then they shoot to a live press conference where George Floyd family leaves the courthouse to come outside for another press conference for Dante Wright, who was killed on Sunday night by a police officer saying that she was trying to reach for a taser. Mm -hmm. And anybody that know anything about guns and tasers, they do not even wait the same. Like, that's a whole different kind of conversation. You know what I mean? And what kind of training are you guys doing that you don't know that all, all these officers talk about you wear your firearm on what? Your dominant side. So it's not about it's automatically on your left or your right, but you know your dominant side is where your handgun is. The taser is supposed to be on your least dominant side. So right there alone, how could you even get that twisted? You know what I'm saying? And then what, what what really killed me was this is in the same vicinity, almost a year to the date of George Floyd. The miles away. Mm -hmm. Like this is so sad. It's like we talking about all this movement and NBA raising money for black colleges and all this other kind of stuff. What difference does all of that make if real change 
is it happening? Like when, 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 when I always say, you know, people think that I'll be joking about it. I tell people all the time, I just want to make it to the precinct. You know what I mean? How about you just take me to the, to the, you know what I mean? Take me to the prison. There's already four or five of y'all or whatever the case may be, but allow me the opportunity to go to jail. You don't have to shoot me. You don't have to kill me dead in the streets. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't understand how, you know, and then you know how it is. They're going to always, this is why I don't like trials like this, or I don't like watching trials like this here, because, you know, they always go into the fact of, they always victimize the victim to me. Well, he was on drugs. He was, he was, he was drunk. He was this. He was at coherent. He was resisting arrest and everything else. At the point, where you have a man that's down on the ground and you have your knee in his neck, he is no longer a threat to you. Mm -hmm. That is not resisting. When you're laying flat on your stomach with your head distorted, handcuffed behind your back, that is not resisting. Test to true. You know, and, and it's like they're going back and forth on the, on the, in, the, in the court today. They had one of the young ladies that was actually in um in the vehicle with 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 them when, it, when the traffic stop stopped. And now it, was, it wasn't a traffic stop. Young man, I'm sorry, Dante Wright was a traffic stop. But George Floyd, they called that the police were called because he had supposedly used a counterfeit bill. Now, the whole time that she's talking today during the court hearing, every time she says something, excuse me, man, like just yes or no. And you could tell it was like frustrating her. And at one point she actually says like, all right, do you want me to say yes or no? Or do you want me to actually explain what happened? <laughs> he like... Explain what happened. Then she gets to start and explain what happened. And I guess he felt she was explaining too much. So he's like, well, no, no, man. We don't need all of that there. And she could tell she was really frustrated. But I bring that up is because when they bring up the uh, the excessive force specialist, this man goes around the country just teaching how to use excessive force. What is excessive force? For works for the FBI, police departments, and all these other kinds of things. Anytime he got ready to talk, he going in details. You know what I mean? Well, he couldn't have been, he wasn't really on top of him when he had his knee on his neck. I can't say that he was on top. Like, dude, what happened to the same energy with the yes or no? Did he have his knee on that man's neck? Yes. Was it excessive force? Could be. No, it ain't no could be. That's a yes or no question. You see what I'm saying? But they don't do that with when it comes to them. It, it, it's just so, it's just so saddening to me. It's so sad to me because we live in a sick, sick world. We live in a sick world with all this stuff going. Black men being killed by, by police. Human trafficking, which nobody ever seems to want to talk about. But it's real. These are people. These are human beings that's being stolen and sold like furniture. Yeah. Um. There's this there's there's a there's something going on that has been going on for centuries and it is now kitchen table talk in inside of white homes inside of white families and it's a piece of information that has been passed down from every white person to every other white person and that is how to look at a human being and dehumanize them in moments. Um, it is because white people have a history of dehumanizing, not especially black people, but not only black people, themselves as well. Yeah, each other too, yeah. Where you are. So in the dehumanization of a person, there's also something that's created psychologically that 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 uh as a byproduct of that which is fear because you may go to a zoo and see a gorilla and you don't look at a gorilla as a human or even a being it's a gorilla but you're also very afraid of a gorilla because you know it can snatch your face off <laughs> so instead of trying to save the gorilla you shoot it because you are more fearful of it than it is of you um so that's what's happening with black humans, with black people. Um, they have been socialized to believe that people of color are not human and they are people to be feared. Mm -hmm. 
it's there. Hold on, I'm sorry. Sorry, I gotta gotta call Thank you. you. For my, on do not disturb. Give me a second. Uh, sorry about that. There are people who um. So it is. It's sad to see. Um, it's heartbreaking to see. I think Elijah McClain, I've never watched a George, George Floyd video. I, I, my, my stomach can't take it. Um, I heard about Elijah McClain and that took me up through, through the roof because when I see my people, when I look at my people, my black and brown people, my melanated people, I see such magic. I see such gold in, 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 in perseverance and resilience I, I see like when I go out and I see black men dancing to step in I see you know black women you know pushing their fro back I see black love especially here in Charlotte you go to Freedom Park and you see these beautiful black couples laying on their blankets and everything enjoying that sun without sunscreen <laughs> when I see that my heart burst and I can't tell you when I walk past when I walk past a white person, there's this innate fear that I have. And it's crazy to me because we are just as fearful of them. When you're the only black person in the room, there's this thing like you're looking for somebody, you're looking for your brother, you're looking for your sister. There are there are towns that I go in right out of, outside of Charlotte, there's this place called Matthews. And I went to Matthews and all I saw was white people. I got so scared I came back to Charlotte because I was on a, I'm afraid of what's gonna happen to me if I'm the only black person here. Mm -hmm. And there's this, de, again, this dehumanization that gives them the, the justification for taking a life, no matter how young, Tamir Rice, Dwayne Wright, no matter how young, no matter how old, and then saying, you know what, you deserved it. The lady who took Dwayne uh, Wright's life is, um, is it right or white? I don't want to- Dante, Dante Wright. Dante, so oh gosh, Dante, I'm sorry, you guys. Dante, took Dante's life was on the force for 20 something years. So the excuse that she didn't know whether she had a gun or not, because she, she got her badge when she was 22. She's 46 now. Kim Porter, I, and this crazy, I know her name, but she should, and, and, here's, and here's something else that they're doing too. When they're releasing um, the stories about her, they're not even using her face. They're using the, the, the chief, chief officer who's a black man. Mm -hmm. So it's propaganda to deter you mm -hmm. from seeing this white woman, and, they, oh, and they're using her good pictures because she's 46, but the pictures they're using, they're using her when she was like 30 something, and she looks young in the face, okay? in these pictures. They're trying to make her sound like she's this great white woman who just made a mistake, but they don't give that same type of leniency when it comes to black boys. They don't give that same, same type of leniency of black, to black women. And black women are more at risk of being killed by the police because in the year of 2020, black women died at four times the rate by officers than black men. But there's a value to black men that it's not on place on black women because if they say a black woman got killed at a traffic stop, then it wouldn't be as much of an outrage. So there's so many black women are going up under the radar that are being killed by officers at traffic stops. Invasion, like Breonna Taylor was one of the few, but there, there was, I think, about 40 something women that died in, from 2019 to 2020. And we don't know, all I know is Breonna Taylor and there's Sandra Bland was in 2000, what, 17? Yeah. Well, 16. So the 16, so this 16, goes where we are with it. Mm -hmm. um, supremacy is, is, the, is the sickness, the true sickness. And we want to talk about psychological sickness. Mm -hmm. S supremacy is a sickness that tells somebody, in order for me to stand tall, somebody else has to kneel. Exactly. And with that being said, it is going to take these younger kids who are growing up in their sinners because now you have the internet, you have social media, things are being blasted. And they are like, no, we're not going to do this. They are, these young kids from the ages of 25 and under are dismantling all of the isms and schisms right in front of our faces. And so once this, this next two generations die out, well, we got the baby boomers and we got the, who came after the baby boomers? It wasn't generate. it wasn't a millennial. I, I don't, I don't. 
I don't know. I don't even pretend. I know you got a generation X, Z, or right. millennials. But, but, I'm telling you, the, the world is going to change because these young kids, they have too much information. They know way more than what we, that, than what I knew, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not old, old, but you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm mm -hmm. definitely like, I'm, I'm, you know, late twenties. So early, anyone from 25 and under, we're talking about, they are going to change the game, but go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm ranting. No, no. Nah, nah, what you were saying was absolutely true. And me and, me and my brother, Kevin, we had talked about that on another show. You know, saying he was saying the same thing. You know, he think that true change is going to come because these young folk they thinking totally different. They thinking outside the box. They close to actually throwing the box away. You know what I mean? It's not. It's not as much about race as it was a hundred years ago. You know what I'm saying? And daddy, you can hate black folk all you want to, but I rocks with Raheem. You know what I mean? That's my man. Like Raheem never did me wrong. So I don't know what you're talking about, but I think we are getting toward that way. And Ann said it, like he said, he said he hate to say it, but that is their version of the purge, like the movie The Purge. And it's sad because it's true, like you say, I tell people all the time, you got to be real careful with the news. That's another reason that I don't watch the news because I'm one of those people, you know, people say, well, you just a conspiracy theorist. You can call me whatever you want to. I'm a, I'm a free thinker that I think whatever I want to think and feel how I do feel. I have no problem admitting it. But it's like when I think of the news, I've seen countless times in my city where you would see different things on the news. But if you were actually there, the news report is nothing at all like the truth. It's not factual, whatever. It's a story. So one thing I always try to tell people with, with the news is you got to be careful with the news. Well, it was on the news. Okay. You got to remember, only thing that the news is going to show you is what they want you to see or what they want you to know. You know what I mean? So, like you said, they got a they got a whole different narrative. It's sad to say that we living in a society that's dominated by them. That, like you said, a life is a life. But if a black woman gets killed doing the same thing, doing a stop, we're not going to see it on the news as much because, like you said, it's not going to cause the same a, a level. Of, it's not going to cause that same emotion. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we always talk about even the black, even me. I talk about it a lot because it's close to my heart. But I'm quite sure if we did some real research, we could find some incidents where officers have killed white or white children, white kids, white teenagers. You know what I'm saying? They ain't taking all of them. To, I just said dropping them off at the house. There are, are incidences where that, that have been too, but we will never see that on the news. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's not, it doesn't get the fire. It doesn't get the temperature raised enough to cause the commotion that they want to do. Because the minute we start up one, then they just playing into the trap. Because now we got more reason to lock more of them up, to get more of them records, and to shoot more. Of them. Because now I'm really scared that I don't know what they're gonna do. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, I was in fear of my life. That's the that's their favorite words. I was in fear, I was in my fear life. of my life. Yeah, it's just, it's just crazy. It's just crazy, sad, sad times, man. And I'm with you. I, I try to keep stay positive. And I hope that we do get real change and, you know, take place in this lifetime. Even if I don't get to see it, I hope that that day actually comes. I do, too. And, and, and I think because it shouldn't matter a lot of the stuff that, you know, we're, we're people say, you know, we're the smartest species. We're actually the dumbest. I mean, because think about it. We're the only species that have to pay to live on this earth. That's one. And we're the only species that use phenotypic adaptations, which is, that's all race is. It is honestly just a phenotypic adaptation. Sorry, I, my phone's about to die, so I'm plugging it up. I'm doing the most right now. Nah, you good. But uh, phenotypic adaptations, which cause us to produce mel melanin based upon where we were at the time our ancestors were when, when uh, the origin story, right? So if you were south of the equator or north of the equator, you either develop melanin because it was, it's an adaptation or you did it. And so for that to be the reason why you separate based upon like the spotted owl doesn't kill the unspotted owl. Like we're, we use something that simple and then we use just the smallest thing, you know, money, which is a concept because technically if we want to live on this earth for free, we could. 
You know, there were civilizations that were doing it well beforehand yeah. where they built housing for the community. Everybody lived together. It was communal because we're communal. We're com and, I'll, and I say this and I mean this, but I'm, and I mean this. We're communal, communal animals. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I so I'm sure if we look, we could find some civilizations over across the world on the other side of the world that still live that way. They do. And no, they don't have any currency. They either take care of each other. You got your farmers. You got that. We got the barter system. And we just, you know what I mean? You, we don't need no cameras here. We don't need no TV. We don't need no electricity because we, this is how we've been surviving since the beginning. <laughs> but it, how great would it be if we had all that, with the electricity, the TV, and all that kind of stuff? But we had a community where, like, yo, um, everybody had housing. Everybody had food. Like, we had people that grew food for the entire world. You know, but we live in a very capitalist, global society. You go, you just said it. That's why we'll never see that because we live in a capitalist society. Yeah, and people ain't trying to give their money. But um, <laughs> I do, um, I do believe that we we will see some change, and I do believe that Black people um are making great strides. And I, I'm sorry to hear about all the death. Uh, then there was a school shooting. Exactly. So it's there was another a mess. officer involved shooting in, in New York. I mean, I was reading so much sickening stuff on the bottom line while this trial was going on today. Then, uh, then you had the officer it was December twenty twenty, the the second lieutenant in the army, black Latino guy. He gets pulled over by two officers in his uniform, and they pull yeah. gun him out and pepper spray him and everything go. Why he's fully in uniform? And they police chief came out and said that they were totally wrong for that day. It was totally unnecessary, especially for a traffic stop. <laughs> they are afraid of black people. And, and, and Farrakhan said it best. Farrakhan said, you are afraid that we will do to you what you've done to us. Exactly. And when and you sit in that, you sit in that guilt and you sit mm -hmm. in that, because you know, white people, not all of them, but some of them are so like, I didn't do anything to you. I never owned slaves, but you benefit from the system that was created by slaves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the thing that that's the part to me. That's that part to me. Like they just don't get that. And I don't understand. I don't understand. And I, that has nothing to do with me. I love you for who you are. But yeah, you're able to get a you're able to get a loan. You're able to get benefits because of what your ancestors did to my ancestors. You might not. You might. Like you said, I tell people all the time, you know, it's no different than the mob. You know what I mean? We, you watch the mob wives and the children of the people in the mobs. Yeah, they get to go to Saks Fifth Avenue. They get to go to all that there. You're not selling drugs, but you're benefiting from the destruction of people. You know what I'm saying? So you can't call, your, you can't call yourself such righteous because you ain't out on the corner. You're still benefiting from it. Now, it's one thing if you say, you know what, nah, I'm going over here. I'm doing my own thing. I'm going to get my own job. I don't want none of daddy money, and I'm going to use my own connections. That's something that's totally different. But it's far a few, few more that I don't think that they understand that in the, in the totality of things, that you're still benefiting from it. Whether you're partaking in it or not firsthand, you're still benefiting from it. Is this true? Beverly says that the real fear is that we are soon to become the majority. And I can imagine that is such a scary thought process for them. You know what? I, I want to challenge that theory. I want to challenge that real quick. Hold on, let me turn this AC off because my thing is loud. I don't think it's, they're not fearful of us becoming the majority. Um, because keep in mind, we look at cattle, the cows always outnumber the, for, always outnumber the farmers. They want it that way because we're consumers. They're not scared of that. Mm -hmm. What they're afraid of is that because you can have a society hell bent on ignorance like we can have billions of consumers just that want to be consumers they go to work they follow the laws of the land they don't make no fuss they don't make no nothing and they just do what they do and that's their perfect society how can we have all these black people doing making white people money which we do mickey d's walmart we spend billions trillions of dollars every year for these white owned companies right but the thing is the fear, the true fear is the educated black man and educated black woman. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, there's more educated black women than ever. They're outranking 
every demographic, white, black, doesn't matter. Black women are superseding and completely outdoing every other race when it comes in the education field. But now there's something also that people are getting afraid about. The 1% of people who own most of the wealth in the world are happen to be people that are non-melanated, white people. When that shifts and the wealth gap is closed, which is why they're trying so hard to keep black people in such a, uh, in such a uh, impoverished level, like the poverty level. And I think the poverty level is anybody who makes 25,000 a year or less or 30 some thousand or less. What's happening now is black people learning about investing, black people learning about dividends. They're taking stock in the company in that, that they work for. They're taking stock in companies that they're not working for. They are getting home loans. And that's what they're trying so hard because you know the cornerstone of wealth in America is home ownership. Mm -hmm. So black people buy homes, black people starting businesses, black people, you know, having businesses, black people having a bank. This is what scares them. It, we could literally be the minority for the next hundred years. But if the majority of the minority go into business, start Black Wall Street up again, have wealth circulating through our communities, that's what's going to scare them. That's what they're afraid of, mm -hmm. because you can have a population that's still poor and, th and that's good. But to have a population that is wealthy. Mm -hmm. that's the fear because then once that shifts once you change the power dynamics the money dynamics you change the power dynamics and once you change the power dynamics oh baby the world as they know it cease to exist absolutely and i agree with that from that from the aspect of you only give me one you can have racial equality i want economic equality that you know what I'm saying? You know, I could be a nigga, I could be a spare sucker, whatever you want to call me, as long as I have equal economic equality. That's the most important thing. Like you said, that's that's the real fear because we can't affect their bottom line. You know what no. I mean? Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't, because if I let you start your own business, how I'm gonna feed my family. And, and the sad thing is, most of these people is not a max, it's not a thing where they actually need more money. We're talking about billionaires. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? We're talking about billionaires and millionaires over hand, fist over hand. And it's like, how much money do you need? You can't take, you can't do nothing with it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Once you're gone, you're gone. But you that you still fear of the of the 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 thought concept of black people having the same being afforded the same opportunities economically to do the same exact things that you do. Yeah, because then you're, you're, that, that affects everything. I, I got a friend from, um, and I think this is so amazing, right? Um, but just to give an example of something that I feel like America should uh, change, uh, credit. So there's a lot of things that affect your credit. And you could be a Black man with $20,000 in the bank right now and still be denied for loans and certain things based upon your credit. Right. And that's the reason why it takes so so long for credit to build, because they know that somebody of color can have money, but still have poor credit, because this is on your record from you. You breed a situation of history where black people are prone to have bad credit because, number one, we're not taught financial literacy like white kids are when we're growing up. And then number two, we're more we're predominantly placed into situations where we have to get loans because we sit below the poverty level, get loans and then not pay them back because we financially can't pay them back. We need the loan because we don't have the money, you know, and then we can't catch up and everything. So it, it's, it's definitely sabotage for black people. But here's the thing, credit in Germany was something completely different. So credit in Germany is based upon your, um, your, your basically your status and your participation in government. For example, if you go vote, that affects your credit score. In Germany, if you go vote, it increases your credit score. If you don't vote, it decreases your credit score. If you participate in charities, it increases your credit score. So these things where they want you to be a productive member of society goes into your credit. America needs to do the same exact thing. I think that would be amazing because then what that does is not only does it breed Black people to participate in government, which most of us don't, we're talking about a, a, a large number of percentage before this election, a large number of black people didn't vote. So now they voted because now that it was something that was at stake. But before uh, Stacey Abrams and a few other black faces came out and said, look, we need to vote. Black people were disinterested in voting. But if they found that this can help your credit, which can then help you get a loan, home loan, business loan, yeah. uh, all of this. I vote. Can, 
yeah, it changes. Mm-hmm. It changes the mentality of how Black people look at credit, money. It also, again, it helps close that that gap between where Black people sit on the wealth line and where white people sit on the wealth line. And so I think that's just very interesting. Mm-hmm. What you know about that, Bev? Bev, if you still watching, what you know about it? Because I, I got a cousin that's watching. She used to live over there in Germany. She was stationed in Germany for a while, for, for years. But oh, that, yeah, they treat that, that people good. Yeah, that, that, would be, that would be a great, great concept over here. Because yeah, like yeah. you said, it, it gives you an incentive to want to be more involved. You know what I mean? As opposed to, well, I got to go, I got to fill all these applications. And every time they put do a hard inqu- inquiry, I'm losing points and, you know, things of that nature there. It's like it, it's, it's a system that's working against us. Something like that there, to me, I can never really see happening here for the simple fact is more is an equalizer. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that is, is that common denominator now? Now you can't put it on based off a of race. You know what I'm saying? Unless you just keep certain offices only in the suburbs or whatever the case may be, then we're going to have to deal, they're going to deal with, then they're going to already do what they're doing now, which is why every, I think it's every four years or so, you got this zoning. <laughs> they, why you keep rezoning? If you just rezoned a few years ago, what, what makes you have to rezone again? It's because they need these numbers and these political things to meet the criteria to push their head objective, so to speak. That part is true. That, that, that part is absolutely true. So I, I think it's going to be interesting. We, we, we can definitely use something like that. But a lot of countries outside of America are adopting, you know, inclusivity in, in government and incentivizing things like that in the government as far as you participating, because the government is that of the people. So, but America, yeah, they're, they're, they're not going to do that uh, no time soon, because again, the, the real fear for them is not the overpopulation of Black people. The real fear for them is Black people having the say based upon their actual representation. Mm-hmm. That if the black people make up the majority of the world or the majority of America, that the vote would be bigger, right? And then that black people will then run the government, we run the judicial system, executive office, uh, executive yeah, judicial that. legislative, like all of that. So yeah, yeah, that's 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 just my take. That's that's my thing, yo. <laughs> that's cool, girl. Well, I'm I'm so glad you took the time out to do this. I definitely appreciate it. I appreciate your love, your energy. Uh, before we get out of here, though, I ain't tell you about this, but I got a couple of quick hitters I want to hit you with. I ain't okay. want to tell you on because I ain't want you to have time to think of them. I've only actually did this with one other guest so far, too. But I want to do it from time to time. All right, so what's, what's your favorite word? Superfluous. Say that one more time. Superfluous. You is it just my favorite word? Superfluous. Okay. And what does that mean? I'm not excessive. It means excessive. excessive. Okay. Oscar Wilde said nothing, nothing's ex- excess like excess, yo. But go ahead. Exceeds like excess. All right. Yeah, Bam said they also have a four-day work week over in Germany. Yep. They That's do that cool. too. <laughs> That's cool. I like that. All right. What's the least favorite word? <sighs> Hate. I should have said love for my favorite, but hate is my least favorite word. I hate hate. Okay. What turns you on? Um, an intelligent intelligence. I'm about to say intelligent man, but intelligence. Ooh, mm, I gotta love All right. it. All right, we we'll go to the library this week. All right, so crazy. <laughs> what turns you off? Um, ignorance. I can't stand ignorance. It's horrible. Okay. All right. What profession other than your own would you like to attend? If it's, if it's not singing or acting, I definitely would do cooking. I love to cook. Cooking? Okay. That threw me for a while. All right. That's surprising. All right. Let me find out you know how to throw down in the kitchen, girl. Always. Get your life. I'm from the South South. Get your- okay. You can show me, baby, and you can tell me. You know, that's what hey, I live by. You ready I to eat? Talking. What's that? Let me know when. <laughs> um, what 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 profession other than that you that other than your own would you not least like to do? Mm. Mm. 
being a doctor, I don't like, I, I don't like, I still to this day can't watch like little medical stuff where they cutting bodies open. I can't do it. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Um, you, you're on a deserted island. You get to have five albums, any genre, any artist you want. What's those five albums? Dang, five? Okay, so it's not going to be, um, oh, I got to. I can only get three. So um, I definitely will have uh, Frank Ocean's Channel Orange because I can listen to that from front to back. Um, I would have um, uh, Jasmine Sullivan Hotels. Um, I would have Anita Baker's The Greatest Hits. Mm -hmm. uh, where are we at? Three? Yeah. Three. Jill Scott's Who Is Jill Scott? Um, and then I would have um, Kendrick uh, Lamar to Pimple Butterfly. Interesting. So th that's a very different and wide range of uh, five. Okay. And the last one. If heaven, <laughs> Bev says these sound like personal questions. Nah, it's not personal. I actually say that I ask this to Kev as well. I actually say exact questions to Kevin as well. So it's not about being personal. <laughs> All right, but the last one. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you enter the pearly gates? Girl, you did exactly what I thought you would do. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what I want to hear. You did exactly what I what I want you to do. Absolutely, you did. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Again, thanks for doing this. You know you're gonna be. I'm gonna. I'm gonna hit you up. We're gonna be on along. Tell the people, tell the viewers before we go how to get at you to check out your um. Or when is it that your next song, your single is coming out? So my single all night feature, Mr. Talkbox, the amazing Mr. Talkbox, is gonna be dropped on the eighth of May with a video and another another surprise. But you guys find that out once you you know get there. Um, also, you can find me on all social media. I'm on Instagram, the real Janelle Simone, J A N E L L E S Y M O N E. You can see all my videos there as well as my behind the scenes singing videos. Um, you can also find me on Janelle Simone on Facebook, and I am Janelle Simone S Y apostrophe m-o-n-e on spotify itunes apple music just and you can google me actually i'm googleable just google me and all my stuff will pop up as well yeah y'all do that y'all go out there subscribe purchase and become a part of love bug nation <laughs> then you better say it love bug nation yeah but girl i'm gonna let you go i know you need to get you something to eat before the night is over and everything shut down but thank you a million thank you for your well wishes know that i love you and we definitely gonna do this again absolutely thank you i love you you're back. welcome you're welcome and with that being said yandre and lysha know that daddy loves you intentionally but i also love you unconditionally so next week peace and remember guys next week we're gonna be on monday night not tuesday night all right see y'all then <laughs> Bye.